QSO Today, Episode 234, Fred Lloyd, AA7BQ. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers for every level of the amateur radio operator. Visit ICOM at www.icomamerica.com forward slash amateur to find out more about ICOM's exciting line of products. And by QRP Labs, makers of the QCX single band transceiver kit and a host of other QRP radio kits and parts for the ham radio builder. Click on the link to QRP Labs in this week's show notes page. Please support the QSO Today podcast by supporting these fine sponsors. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. Perhaps the oldest online internet resource for amateur radio operators is QRZ.com. Now with over 700,000 subscribers, it is one of the most popular ham radio services founded by my guest today, Fred Lloyd, AA7BQ. While I have used QRZ.com for years, I was unaware of many of its resources beyond the call sign lookup. Join me in this QSO today with AA7BQ, where we deep dive into Fred's ham radio story and his QRZ.com. AA7BQ, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Fred? 4Z1UG, this is AA7BQ Fred in Scottsdale, Arizona. Nice to hear you, Eric. Thanks, Fred. Thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? It's I fell in love with ham radio long before I got into ham radio. When I was about 17, my uncle purchased uh, literally a truckload of old CB gear and he had a TV repair business at the time, and I was helping him fix things. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I enjoyed trying to fix things. And uh, immediately I got very interested in two-way radio, and I realized from the onset that CB was just a kind of a gateway drug to ham radio, and I immediately thought it would be nice to get into ham radio. Unfortunately, I couldn't discipline myself to to learn the code, and so my my goal went nowhere, and and I really didn't do a thing with ham radio until I was 35 years old, and at that time I was working in Silicon Valley, uh, in uh, San Mateo, California, and at that time there was a HRO store there, and I would go there. It was in Burlingame. I would go there at lunchtime and just kick the radios and look at them and think how nice it would be if I could use one. And then I made the decision, I'm going to do it. And I got my license. Uh, I studied the code. I uh, I immediately advanced up through the classes because I'd already had an FCC license, uh, first class radio telephone uh, from the 70s. And so the technical part of it wasn't really an issue for me. It was just the code. And I mastered that. And within two months, I uh, made it all the way to extra class. And so that's been... Uh, 30 since 1985, so how 33 years now. So you actually um, let time and experience uh, kind of put you in the in the the shoot for amateur radio. Did it seem like uh, you became a regular at the HRO store in Burlingame, and and did the uh, folks that work there notice? I don't believe they did notice me very much because it wasn't long after that that I started going to the HRO store in Sunnyvale. But more importantly, the thing that was the big catalyst for me was this was the uh, monthly ham fest that they had there. I believe it was in it was between San Jose and Sunnyvale. It's the the big ham fest there once a month. That's where I really got into it. So we'll have to look that one up and uh, put that in the show notes page. Okay, so you're a 35-year-old ham radio operator. What was it at that time that interested you in, in ham radio? Was it uh, HF, uh, VHF, UHF? At the time, the, the bands were in very good condition, and I was able – My first, I, the first two radios that I purchased, one was a Kenwood TS-820 for the house and a Kenwood 220 radio for the car. Believe it or not – at the time in northern in the, the Bay Area, there was a repeater on every single 220 frequency. It was a, it was hugely popular, and it made a huge difference in my life because I had to drive about 12 miles to work, and it was taking upwards of 45 minutes. The traffic there was horrible, and I became a pretty aggressive, pretty angry driver, 
I hated driving to work. It was horrible. And then when I got my radio, suddenly I didn't mind the drive at all. I enjoyed talking to people. I enjoyed making friends. And I was actually looking forward to either the beginning or the end of the day when I could hop in the car and start rag chewing again. That was the big thing for me. You became interested in electronics working with your uncle. Where did that lead you to? Where did you get your education and how did your career evolve? I worked with my uncle. I was 17 years old at the time. And by the time I was 18 in high school, I was taking electronics classes and I managed to get a job in a local TV radio repair store. And then uh, not long after that, I kind of decided to sow my wild oats as a, as a young man. And I just bummed around and did odd jobs. I, I was a, a truck driver, a carpenter, uh, an electrician, a, a car mechanic, uh, you name it. I would just take any job. Uh, and I was just having fun uh, I thought I might be a, a long-haired hippie for a while, which didn't really work for me. But I didn't do very much with it until 1974 when I went to work at a carnival game manufacturing company. And they had electronic carnival games, uh, a lot of bells and buzzers and, and water pistols and things like that. But I figured out how to install a microcomputer in them and and... I, I taught myself microcomputer programming from the books that were available at the local electronic stores. Uh, and I learned, I, you know, I learned it from the bit level upwards, uh, from the chip level upwards, which was basically all we had back in the, in the late 70s. I had some of the first computers to come out. I had the TRS-80. I had the Apple II. Uh, I went to IBM training school in 1980 to, to uh, learn how to fix the IBM PC. Back then, it was a, a big deal to get certified by IBM. I was working in a computer store as a computer repairman by then. I uh, worked in uh, at TRW Electronics. Uh, I did programming for them on electronic test equipment. Uh, and then I worked as a, a, an assembly language programmer writing device drivers for the PC. And... All of that uh, led to me uh, eventually, after a couple of moves, I ended up in Silicon Valley and I went to work for Sun Microsystems in their operating systems department as a, as a software engineer, a programmer. Uh, and I stayed at Sun for 18 and a half years. I actually did not go to college and I don't have any formal education in computer engineering. I learned every bit of it from self-study and on-the-job training. And how was that school? Well, I think it went really well for me. <laughs> uh, I, I reached, I attained a management level position in Sun Microsystems, and I actually had people with advanced degrees uh, reporting to me. I really didn't, uh, I didn't really mind that much that, uh, uh, that I didn't get to go to college. I do think now that had I had to do it all over again, I probably would just for the experience. Uh, but I I have learned over the years that that fresh college graduates with no experience are, you know, they've got a lot of learning left to do. And I did the learning. I just didn't have the college education ahead of it. Now, you said you had the first class radio telephone. Did you do a stint as a as a broadcast engineer or a, a to a radio technician? I did as a broadcast engineer. It was interesting that when I left the Carnival Game Manufacturing Company, I just basically got bored and decided, well, I think it would be fun to work in radio. And so I went down to the same electronic store where I bought the CMOS handbook and I bought the uh, first class radio telephone operator's license book, did some self-study for a week or so in my, in my home, and then went down and took the test. Then I went to the phone book and started calling every radio station in town, asking if they needed an engineer. And within a couple of days, I landed a job at WRXB, St. Petersburg, Florida. It was a 1,000-watt daytime-only AM station. Uh, playing soul music in uh, Central Florida, and it was a blast. I absolutely loved it. 
Did you also become an on-air personality? I never did, except uh, it was funny. They were allowed to broadcast at night if uh, for testing purposes only. And so once a month, I would go on at night to test the transmitter, and I would just play a couple of records, and the phone would start ringing, and people were wondering who I was. And <laughs> it was very fun. What was the hometown? The hometown at that time was St. Petersburg, Florida. Was that the hometown where you grew up as a kid? That was one of the hometowns where I grew up as a kid. My father was a soldier uh, in the Army, and we we moved every three years throughout my entire childhood. I went to 13 different schools by the time I graduated high school. And so we, we, we lived in St. Petersburg more than any other town. For example, when my dad went to Vietnam, we stayed in St. Petersburg. And so my formative teenage years were, were in St. Petersburg, Florida. I read an article that suggested that not only were you very gifted with computers and, and writing code, that, that potentially you were actually a hacker. Is that an, a good description of the early Fred Lloyd? It depends on how you want to define hacker. You know, there are hackers that seek to, uh, to go places where they're not supposed to go and gain access to things they're not supposed to see and things like that. That's not the kind of hacking that I've ever engaged in. I've been the type of hacker that would take two pieces or two items that either didn't work or weren't supposed to work together, and I would hack them so they would work together. So I would, for example, I would, when, in the early days, I didn't have a guitar amplifier, so I, I literally picked up a, a discarded stereo console piece of furniture that had a broken record player and broken radio and brought it home and managed to salvage the amplifier out of it, and I made myself a guitar amplifier out of that. That's the kind of hacking I've always enjoyed doing. Mm, that sounds like the best kind of hacking. You're the founder of QRZ.com, and I, I think that anybody listening to the QSO Today podcast knows of the of QRZ.com. Uh, I think it's probably the most popular and most famous uh, ham radio website and probably ham radio's first online social network. How did that start? Well, I was on the Internet in as early as 1986, but back then, the Internet wasn't recognizable as, as it is today. There was no World Wide Web. We didn't have browsers. In fact, many of us didn't even have computers capable of displaying graphics. We had just text-only type of computers. And we were on the Internet with that in discussion groups, mostly mailing lists, uh, very similar to the forums we have today, only all text-based and back then there was a, in in the, uh, let's see, it was in the early 80s, I was in, or in the late 80s, I was into uh, uh, the amateur radio news groups on what was known as Usenet. And there was a ham radio group in there, and all of them were talking about how neat it would be to have a call book on, on available online. And everybody thought it was a great idea, but the call book wasn't really in digital form uh, that was accessible to many people. And someone mentioned that the FCC, you could get a copy of the FCC data, but it cost $700. Nobody wanted to put that kind of money forward. And I, and I just raised my hand in the group and I says, well, how about if I pay the $700 and then make copies of the data, which was legal, and sell it to everyone else for 20 bucks. And everybody said, yeah, let's do it. So I did that. I ordered the, the tape. It was a magnetic tape, a half inch magnetic tape, a huge thing. Ordered it from the FCC and I started making copies on quarter inch tape and selling those. And I did that and it went well. And with that first tape, I made, I set up a, a dial up bulletin board system in, in my, in Scottsdale, Arizona which served about 100 people around town, and I was advertising it on the local swap net, uh, just telling people to come there. And it was just a place for people to come look up call signs was all it was. Then about six months later, uh, everyone on the Internet wanted me to do it again. They wanted fresh data because the data, the, the data was refreshed once every six months by the FCC, but and that was another seven hundred dollars. 
That's right. That was oh. another seven hundred dollars plus. I was uh, not really interested in all the all the work involved in sending these mailed tapes out because it was really a lot of a lot of grunt work. Make a tape, you know, put it in a package, do the postage. It was and and one thing about programmers that everyone should know is that programmers are just naturally lazy. We make our living convincing machines to do our work for us. And so I thought, well, it would be nice if I could distribute this on CD-ROM. And everyone said, oh, I don't know if that'll work because not everybody has a CD. Remember, this was 1992 and 1993. And uh, I went ahead with it anyway, and I found a company that was producing shareware CDs. I asked them if they could, uh, if I could put a copy of my database on one of their existing products. It was only 50 megabytes. And they said, well how about we do a ham radio CD? And I said, well, that's a good idea. So I started putting it together and I, and I called the CD QRZ. I'd just been involved with a contest recently and I heard a lot of people saying QRZ. I thought it was catchy. And so I said, that's <laughs> the name of the CD QRZ. And so the company produced it and uh, it was an instant hit. We were soon selling five to 10,000 copies a month. Uh, they were. And, and sending me royalty checks that were, at the time, very impressive. I thought, my goodness, this is, a, I guess I'm in the CD business now. And shortly thereafter, I, since I was working in the Internet uh, and selling computers, servers, and things like that, I found a small company here in, in, in town that needed some technical help, and so I agreed to help them in my off-duty hours with their with their infrastructure, if they would allow me to put my server in their building and attach it to the internet backbone. And my server was just a tiny little computer, it was nothing. And uh, they said, sure, and that was when QRZ.com first went online. It was in October of 1993. It was one of the first 25,000 websites on the entire internet. It, it, we were established well before Google or Yahoo or Facebook or eBay. We were out there really before all of them. And uh, that has been also quite a bit in our favor because basically we're, we're so well known now that uh, we're in basically every search engine in the world. But that's kind of how it came up. And, and what was that user experience like in 1993? Not much more than just looking up a call sign. We didn't have uh, uh, we didn't have much in the way of graphics, but people still liked it quite a bit. But the secret ingredient, the thing that made QRZ famous, was when I decided to let people upload their pictures, the photo of themselves. That changed everything. People started sending me the photos, and I would edit each one and put it online. I put 30,000 pictures online before I finally decided to let people upload their own directly to the website. And, uh, but, but that was it. The pictures are, are what changed the, the, changed the whole landscape. And now this message from ICOM America, makers of the finest amateur radio transceivers for every level of amateur radio operator. Calling all hams. ICOM knows that amateur radio is all about community and wants to give back to the amateur radio community that has been loyal to it for over 50 years. To this end, ICOM has launched two initiatives. The first, ICOM has launched a promotion exclusively to ham radio clubs. By registering your ham radio club, your club could win an ICOM radio, ICOM swag, a live presentation on Skype, or a live in-person presentation by an ICOM rep at your ham radio club meeting. Secondly, according to the ARRL website, there are over 195 conventions and ham fests scheduled in the United States in 2019. ICOM knows that ham fests play a big role in to bring hams together to learn from their peers and radio industry leaders. ICOM has launched a promotion exclusively for ham fest. Register your ham fest today, and your ham fest could win ICOM swag, a forum presentation, or an ICOM booth set up at your ham fest. For more information and to register your club or ham fest, click on the ICOM image in this week's show notes page. You can also search on Twitter and the Internet using hashtag ICOM everywhere 
one word, that's hashtag ICOM everywhere, or go to icomamerica.com forward slash amateur to register your club or ham fest. My thanks to ICOM America for being such a wonderful sponsor of the QSO Today podcast. Please be sure to tell your dealer on your next ICOM purchase that you heard it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO Today. I read something that, that there's over... 400,000 hams, half a million hams that use QRZ. Is that low or is, does that sound about right? You know, we have 750,000 registered members on the site. Some of those, you know, there's probably 100,000 of them that came registered, took a look, and never came back. <laughs> but on a daily basis, we're still serving every day about 60,000 people. And if you think about that, those are individuals, not hits. Those are individuals, unique individuals. That's, you know, roughly the size of a decent uh, arena or a stadium, 60,000 people. That many people visit QRZ every day. Nowadays, we're serving upwards of a million pages every day. Uh, the average visitor on our site looks at 10 to 12 pages in a, in a single session. And so that's where those numbers come from. So we've established that many hams, so up to 60,000 a day, use QRZ for looking up other hams, I think. But do you recommend a way to get the most out of this amazing ham radio resource that you've created? I mean, I always think that I'm I'm missing something. When I go there, I'll look up a ham or I'll look at the news. But there's the sense that I have that there's so much more underneath there, and I barely scratched the sur surface, but I don't even know where to start. Well, there's... Uh... One thing that's always appreciated and always popular is to is to add as much information to your biography as you can about yourself, pictures and stories, but especially pictures. People like looking at interesting photos. Even if they're not interesting, they still like to see what the other ham looks like. You know, QRZ has changed the way ham radio works because now people are calling Q, uh, CQ on the air and they're getting responses in their first name before the, before the conversation ever starts. That's all because people are looking them up before they, before they answer the CQ. It really has changed everything with respect to ham radio. And I have to say I'm very proud of that. That in addition to my efforts at creating an online test preparation course uh, practice exams that we have on our site, we've graduated, I would think, more hams than any other platform anywhere. I, because I have never gone to anywhere throughout the United States, and I've been to ham fests from coast to coast. Every time people come to me and say, I studied and got my extra class or my general class or my technician class right there on QRZ, and they're always very, very appreciative of that. And I'm I'm very proud of that as well. Do you have some kind of algorithm or something that works uh, with somebody who's studying or taking practice exams so that you're not retesting them on information and questions they've already successfully answered? We do. There's 500 and, I don't know, 530 questions, something like that, in the pool for technician, for example, but only 35 questions on the test. And we track the users uh, that's why we have them log in, but we track their progress and we never give them the same question twice until they've until they've answered all 535. So it it uh, most people never see the same question twice before they pass their license. And do you have links to other like backup information where they could actually, if they have a question about uh, a, a question about the question? that they can actually link to some or hyperlink to some place where they can learn more about the answer? What we have, we, we are in partnership with the W5YI group uh, who publishes all of the Gordon West uh, technical manuals, the license study guides, and we refer people to one of the books that we, that we list on our site when they have questions such as those. Now, I, frankly, I didn't even know that you had this uh, ham test online uh, in QRZ. What other hidden resources are there in QRZ? Well, it's not a hidden resource, but it's very popular, and that's our online logbook. 
the logbook started about five or six years ago, and it is growing steadily. Everyone, uh, a lot of people now are using the QRZ logbook. It's it's free to use. Uh, we do offer some uh, some enhancements that you get with a subscription, but basically we have upwards of about 300 million QSOs recorded in it right now. And a great many people are using that on a daily basis. It's been, it's been really the biggest thing to happen to QRZ in the last 10 years. Also, our, our online forums are very popular. Any subject that's being discussed in ham radio is being discussed on QRZ. Uh, it's not, it, it, it pales in comparison to the call sign search traffic on the website, but even a small portion of a million pages a day is quite a few pages. And uh, so we have the uh, the forums, and then there's the online swap meet where people buy and sell radio gear. That is perhaps the mo largest and most comprehensive online swap meet in ha all of ham radio, and we police it. Uh, some people say a little too much, but it's always our goal to make sure that uh, there's a, as much safety as possible for the online buying public, and uh, we're very proud of that as well. Now, do you create in, in your online swap meet, do you create some kind of a system that um, that grades both the buyers and the sellers, like kind of like eBay does in order to know whether you're buying from a reputable uh, seller? Not really. We don't really have a, any ratings or star rating system of that sort. We we basically have our members use a lot of common sense. We offer guidelines. Every time, without question, when someone looks at something for sale on QRZ, they will also look up the seller by his call sign and look at their call sign page. And then they'll correlate what they see in the call sign page with what's shown in the ad, and that is a strong indication of, uh, of at least uh, consistency. And then we have a separate forum section where people can give recommendations, or either negative or positive, for the sellers, but that's entirely voluntary. It's a, it's a place where people can report bad sellers. But moreover, our moderators have seen so many things. They've seen so many scams. They've seen so many, even more good deals. I mean, the vast majority of all the deals are good, but they've grown quite adept at picking out the scams and uh, the measures that we've included, which which are include this photograph of your call sign along with the item being sold. I noticed yesterday, and this really thought this was interesting, is that people are doing that on eBay now non-hams are doing it just to let people know that they actually have a piece of gear in their possession. It's a great idea, and I'm glad that it's catching on. How about that? Let's go back to the online logbook for just a second. Does it work with any of the um, contesting and DX software? It works with almost all of them. QRZ has grown to such a size now that no decent uh, logging package would be without QRZ support. Uh, how about a link to Logbook of the World? QRZ integrates with Logbook to the World. When you are on the QRZ in the QRZ Logbook, with a couple of button clicks, you can have your entire Logbook of the World. Uh, uh, you can have all of your QRZ records sent to the Logbook of the World in one batch. And similarly, you can download your Logbook of the World to your computer and upload it in one batch to QRZ, and many users synchronize both of them. Uh, there's uh, and 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 there are reasons for that. First of all, users want to get the best chance of getting a confirmation, so they'll they'll upload to both places. And plus, both QRZ and the ARRL issue awards that are. Uh, that are complementary uh, of each other. So, you know, for, for almost every award they issue, well, not every award, but many of the same awards we also issue under our own brand. And uh, they're qu quite popular with the user base. Hey, this is Eric for just a short break. 
One of my favorite ham radio podcasts is the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, hosted by George, KJ6VU, my guest in episode 232, and Jeremy, KF7IJZ. George and Jeremy take a bi-weekly deep dive into their favorite ham radio projects and technologies that fascinate them. If you want to be a ham radio builder, or just be inspired, click on the link in this week's show notes page. Does QRZ sponsor any events? QRZ sponsors uh, uh, in a softer sort of way. We don't sponsor any, we're not the flagship sponsor for any event. However, if local clubs are sponsoring an event or having a, holding an event of some sort, QRZ will donate to that, uh, door prizes and things of that nature, and, and we've done a lot of that. Plus, a lot of clubs, and, and especially those having ham fests, uh, should know that we offer free advertising on our site. Normally, you know, we do sell advertising to commercial advertisers on QRZ, banner ads and things of that nature. But if you're a club and you're holding a ham fest, we serve those for no charge. So many clubs, most clubs should take us up on that. And, of course, there there's probably a, a form or something like that in order to, to submit that. No, you just contact. Uh, we just have the oh, okay. the clubs contact us directly. You know, to editor at qrc dot com. So, Fred, what does it take now to keep QRZ up and running? QRZ has four uh, full time employees, uh, one part time employee, and about a, at least a dozen volunteers working on the site constantly. We have QRZ is a completely virtual business. We don't have a, a, any brick and mortar establishment whatsoever. Uh, I know that some people think that QRZ is in a tall ivory tower in the center of Manhattan somewhere, but the truth is, it's a bunch of guys uh, and girls uh, sitting around, you know, in their home offices uh, <laughs> in front of a computer. Our our, our chief engineer is Stephen, uh, VA7STV. He's in Canada. Uh, but uh, through the power of Skype, it's just like he's sitting here next to us. And then we've got uh, uh, Jamie, our CEO. She's here in Phoenix, as well as Todd, our support manager. He's here in Phoenix. I'm here in Scottsdale, which is right next door to Phoenix. And uh, uh, that's how we operate. Our, we, we no longer own any computers, the servers, that is. Uh, as of 2011, we moved everything to the cloud. All of QRZ is served by the Amazon infrastructure, the Amazon Web Services infrastructure. They're the same people that serve up Netflix. Uh, so if you if you ever watch Netflix at home, you're you're getting data from the same organization that serves QRZ. And what that means is is that we're super fast and we're super available all over the entire planet. Right, because QRZ, I guess on it's, you're using Amazon AWS, aren't you? I think I read that someplace, and um, they're they're all over the world. So it, it, does that mean that you have instances of QRZ in other data centers outside of North America? No, we don't. Our, we only have one central in, instance running, but Amazon's distribution mechanism and and high speed fiber running around the world make it seem like they're local. There's no real need to to have servers distributed for this. Is there some gem in QRZ that we haven't talked about yet that you might want to highlight? Well, one feature that we have that's popular with, with some people is what we call the grid map. We, we have a large Google map uh, application on our site that when you click on any spot on the map, it highlights the grid for those that are doing grid hunting or grid uh, you know, county, grid hunters, I suppose they are. Right, right. When you click on the map, you get a, the square outline of that grid, and then every ham that's registered on QRZ within that grid pops up on the map. It's an exciting little tool. It wasn't all that uh, difficult to put together, but uh, those that do grid hunting really appreciate it. And then another thing that the, that we do with, the, with our geo data is that we give – the, the specific beam heading, wh whenever you're talking to someone, if you hear a station on the air calling CQ, if you can look them up on QRZ, the server will instantly tell you which direction to point 
to to realize the best communications with that distant station. So that's that's another way in which we use the geo uh, capabilities of QRZ. Has anybody made an interface from QRZ to their antenna rotator? Absolutely. I've seen <laughs> it done with the green heron equipment. I've seen I saw an instance, I believe Bob had that set up uh W4PG in Florida set it up so that as soon as he it was using Ham Radio Deluxe, as soon as he typed in a call sign and hit enter, the uh, it would do the lookup of the call sign on QRZ, it would put it in his logbook, and it would turn the antenna to his beam heading. Oh, that's very cool. Does, does QRZ have an app for smartphones yet? QRZ does have a – there are apps. Uh, there's a, both an app for Android, which uh, I wrote, and then there's an app for the iOS for Apple equipment uh, that does call sign lookups. That app is uh, currently being uh, was just purchased by QRZ, and we're going to be rewriting that soon because it's in need of a technical update. Uh, the app is also is very handy in uh, providing grid headings. Uh, I mean beam headings, and it even includes a compass that if you hold it in your hand, the, the arrow on the compass will point to the station. It's a, it's a pretty neat little thing. It's a lot of work to put an app together to use QRZ, and our experience has shown that most of our users don't access, don't use a cell phone or, an, or a tablet as their primary interface into QRZ. Now, that doesn't mean that none do. In fact, I would say that a few thousand hams use QRZ on a mobile device regularly, but it's still a relatively small portion of our overall traffic. And so we don't get to spend as much time working on the apps as we do on the rest of the site, bearing in mind that there really are only four people here and two of them are programmers. That's me and Steven. And I'm uh, in these days, I'm not full time at programming anymore. So you know, we're, we we do have our limitations, and but over time, we try to make everything the best it can be. Is the QRZ website optimized for mobile use, though? Um, if somebody uses a mobile, do you detect that they're coming in on a mobile and, and then format the screens accordingly? We do. However, it's not as good as it could be. Uh, we don't have, a, a, for example, a mobile site that you might find with a bank or something like that. But we have our page. We do adjust our pages to provide the best view possible, and primarily for the home page on a smaller device. But for the for the call sign pages, you know, the you know the individual bios and things like that, there's really not much we can do for those. And uh, you know we have to apologize, but but it's just, there's just a lot of data there, and it's really tough to make it look good on a handheld screen. And now this message from QRP Labs. QRP Labs has shipped thousands of QCX QRP transceivers kits to date. The odds of working another QCX user gets better every day. If you're looking for a satisfying kit experience where you end up with an amazing performing QRP transceiver for under $50, let me say that again, for under $50, then you owe it to yourself to go to QRP Labs. We have many home brewers who listen to the QSO Today podcast. For you, QRP Labs also has parts, filters, enclosures, and other handy devices to make your home brewing experience even better. You can use these parts to either enhance your QRP Labs kits or to beef up your own homebrew designs. Be sure to browse Han's entire website. Use the link on this week's show notes page or the one in the sponsored section of the QSO Today website to get to QRP Labs to buy your QCX or any of the other fine QRP Labs kits or parts. QRP Labs is my go-to ham radio kit company. It should be yours, too. QRP Labs. And now back to our QSO Today. If there's a resourceful ham out there that has the skill set to, to build apps for Android and iOS, um, are the are the hooks available uh, from QRZ to be able to help a third-party developer create an add-on device that would uh, complement QRZ? There are. We have our X, what we call our XML data, which is a, a service at QRZ. And the XML data, it's a subscription service. That's, that's one thing that, that uh, a lot of people will stop a lot of people. But uh, 
through XML data, you can query our server for the data instead of the, the graphics, and you can build your own interface. Now, I say the subscription thing is a, is a barrier for some. It, it's $29 per year for full access to all the QRSA data. That's that's an incredibly small amount of money when you consider that it's a half a tank of gas <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. or, or two bags of groceries for a whole year. And so uh, we depend on those subscriptions to keep the gears running here in the background. And that's why we haven't published or we don't offer a subscription free interface uh, to our primary data. You mentioned earlier uh, that you have 2 million pictures on QRZ loaded up there now. And that it's, it seems to me that with the popularity of, of field ham radio, people going out into the field, they're doing soda, they're doing national parks on the air, that having the ability to update their QRZ page with pictures from their smartphones might be a, 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 an interesting idea. And what you're saying, though, is, is, is that it may be possible for a third-party uh, developer, an app, app developer, to be able to create this kind of a solution for you. Well, you, you're, you're kind of giving me an idea there. Well, that's what I do. <laughs> this is why I'm poor. It, I give, I give away all like, my ideas. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've given away many, and uh, they, they paid off. I just see the way that Snapchat and um, Instagram and these things have kind of, you know, taken the world by storm. It seems to me that the amateur radio community is, pr frankly, no different than, you know, all the other people that are using these services. I tell you, one problem that we have is that we use Google as our as as uh, an advertising partner. Quite a few of the ads shown on our QRZ pages are are they carry Google. They're, they're pr provided by Google. And along with that comes a certain responsibility that Google has content guidelines. And, and, and perhaps one of the most prominent guidelines is that they never want an ad that they supplied appearing alongside objectionable material. And if, if we had, for example, a Snapchat and uh, type of thing, and someone uploaded a a, let's say a dirty picture uh, that gets us in trouble with Google right away. And, and we don't have a team of people available to police that and to watch every image that gets up later. I don't know how they do it at Snapchat. If they've got like a million pictures a minute coming in and you know, how do they sort them out? It's possibly they don't care, but, but we do care here at QRZ. And for that reason, I don't think we can pull it off. Interesting idea. I, I found a video uh, on your uh, YouTube page that you now have a CNC router in your metal shop at your QTH. What are you doing in metal these days with a CNC router? Um, my CNC router is a is a smallish CNC router. I mean, it's uh, 600 by 400 millimeters, uh, which is a little bit less, you know, like two foot by four foot, something like that. Yeah, roughly it's a it's a woodworking machine more so than a metal working machine it can cut circuit board material but a quarter inch aluminum would stop it dead unless i wanted to make a huge mess with tons of oil swinging around in the shop uh so i but what i did do with it my big first big project were the call sign plaques uh with morse code on them i did a few of those and that was a lot of fun people really liked them i could be making them all the time, except that it, it kind of became a job for me and I didn't really want another job. <laughs> and then, but I do have a milling machine and a lathe and I like tinkering and I've been building uh, yard art basically of windmills and things like that, just because I enjoy working with the machine and, and making things. And it has nothing to do with ham radio, but uh, it's been fun. Uh, but again, it's just this is all part of my playtime. Not really much to do with QRZ. Well, going back to QRZ for a section, a second, I have a, <clears throat> another question. Being the the founder of QRZ and and being its probably its chief moderator, does that uh, position give you an opportunity to perhaps see trends in ham radio that that maybe the rest of us don't see? I don't think so. I think that I think that. Uh, Anyone who visits QRZ and 
and spends time there reading the, in the forums, they're going to actually know more about it than I am because I don't I don't really read the forums all that much. Uh, I'm I, the only forum that I'm very active in is the swap meet, and that's only a, in a managerial capacity. The other discussion forums, which are many, are all staffed and manned by volunteers, which I have to give a huge shout out to because without their help, we really couldn't have uh, a discussion forum. But that doesn't really give me a unique, any kind of a unique perspective as to ham radio is going, other than the fact that I see it every day and I see the home page every day. Those things. I, you know, I get a lot of exposure to, but I don't really think it necessarily makes me an expert on where the hobby is going. Before we started, you mentioned to me that you had been a pilot and a flight instructor. Uh, I've actually flown out there in the Phoenix area. It's a great place to learn how to fly and a great place to fly. How did that go for you and why did you stop? I, I first, uh, I took my first solo flight in 1983 and at Sun Microsystems in the, uh, in the late 90s, uh, actually in 1999, I, I had a work-from-home position, and there wasn't a lot going on. They, they, they had me almost practically furloughed in place. I, had, I was still on the payroll, but I had nothing to do, and so I started hanging around at the airport, which was only five miles away. And before I knew it, I, started, I decided, well, I think I'll get an instrument rating, and then I got the instrument rating. And then somebody says, well, why don't you get a commercial? I go, yeah, that sounds like fun. So I spent another month getting the commercial instrument rating. And then somebody goes, well, why don't you get a CFI? You got your commercial instrument. And I go, well, <laughs> so I did that. And then I got my multi. Uh, so I became a CFII, a Certified Flight Instructor Instrument. And then I got a multi-engine endorsement. Uh, and then in, in 2010, uh, I was in the Civil Air Patrol for a while as an active member. I'm still a patron member. Then in 2010, we bought our our bus, which was a uh, kind of a land yacht, uh, an older bus that we picked up. And I decided I was going to travel around the country and uh, attend ham fests everywhere. And once I started driving the bus, I, I kind of stopped flying at the same time. And then before I knew it, a couple of years had gone by. I'd renewed my CFI a few times, three or four times online, and finally decided, well, I'm just not doing this enough. Because when if you're going to be a flyer, you got to do it regularly. You can't fly once in a while and be safe at it. And so I decided, well, I'll just put that away, and maybe someday I'll return to it. I don't regret it, but every once in a while I look up and I see airplanes going by, and I go, yeah, I, I could be doing that, but... I've flown all over Arizona, and I've seen all the desert and all the mountains that one can see. I don't really have much more. It's it's my interests are always towards new things, and it's no longer new is probably the reason I'm not doing it anymore. Do you still travel the country in the bus? Nope, we sold the bus. <laughs> After eight years of that, it was no longer new, and uh, we recently. Uh, got a, a little vacation home up in the mountains of northern Arizona. Well, you know, you mentioned the bus, and and it sounds to me like you were in the bus kind of at the uh, at the height of the technical development of QRZ. Uh, I, I, that's what it sounds like. Um, how did you do that from the road? Well, I hired a, I hired a programmer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. Uh, that was one of the things. And then... For a couple of years while we were on the road, I just didn't work on the site. Uh, I didn't do engineering work on the site except when I was home. So I, was, I would only leave during the summer, and all winter long I would stay here in Phoenix where it's beautiful. Uh, and so I did all my work in the wintertime, basically. What's the current rig? My current rig at home is I've got a Flex Radio uh, 6500 that's uh, in uh, – uh, out in the garage, uh, in a cabinet out in the garage, and, and I've got that network so that I can use it from anywhere, uh, either here in the house or even uh, remotely. So that's worked out very, very well. And then I have uh, an ICOM 7000 little portable that uh, used to be in the bus. And when I sold the bus, I didn't the radio didn't go with it, and uh, I carry that around with me, and I'm uh, 
it's right now looking for a place to set up. So I, I think I'm going to set it up uh, in the cabin, and uh, that'll be my my summertime radio. Is the QTH uh, wired up with Cat six cable, and you've got a in the garage a, a whole uh, server center? I do, but it's not. But it's just for my personal use. There's no uh, there's no QRZ running out there. It's just a file server, and I have uh, just uh, quite a large Wi-Fi and uh, home automation going on here. My wife is uh, fairly disgusted with it because things keep changing. She never knows how to turn the lights on. The TVs are wonky, uh, but I enjoy it. And I have a lot of fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like my wife. She's always wondering who I'm talking to in my office here. And I can't say her name because she starts talking. Are you a musician? I am. Uh-huh. <laughs> I but saw I, some reference to that. Wait, what's your thing? I was a uh, guitar player. I've been playing guitar since the 60s. And uh, I was in some blues bands around town about oh, 10, 12 years ago, maybe longer. I, I've gotten out of playing in bands and... Uh, and, and Lately, and it's very odd, but I've been trying to learn to play the piano, and, and I'm doing this on my own. I'm not really taking lessons because, well, I just don't, uh, I'm not a good student. Uh-huh, <laughs> okay. But it's, uh, it's, just, it's just interesting. I found that if I'm, it doesn't matter what the, the subject is, if I'm interested in it, I'll, I'll learn it, and that's what, the way I'm approaching the piano. Oh, I see. And what other hobbies do you do? My machine shop is really my pride and joy i also uh, electronics i love fixing things i can fix just about anything and it uh whether it be a washing machine or a uh, a data center server you know either one i can i'm equally competent with <laughs> uh-huh do you have a do you have a, a nice workbench electronic workbench not particularly i've just got the, the some standard tools you know i've got a scope a voltmeter a soldering iron you know that sort of thing are you home brewing anything uh, ham radio? Not right now. Uh, well, I, let me take that back. I I uh, I was been trying to build a uh, a ruggedized UHF antenna f for use on an ATV, but and that was building that at the machine shop. But so far, so far, I haven't had a lot of success. What kind of impact has amateur radio had on your family life? Well, it's had a it's it's had a huge positive impact for me because. It's allowed me to work from home. I've been working from home for the last 15 years. And ever since I, uh, I left uh, Sun Microsystems, which was a corporate job in 2006, it was really the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I, can't, I, I only wish that Sun Microsystems would have laid me off sooner. And that's because I started the business of QRZ in 1993, and I worked on it part-time from home at, you know, in the evenings. For uh, until 2006, it was just a part-time job for me. And then, of course, in 2006, I went full-time with QRZ, and it that transition went so well that I only wish it would have happened sooner because it allows me to spend every single day at home with my wife, and uh, I think that's a treasure that most people would underrate if uh, if they were told about it. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? I think the the thing that I like interests me the most about amateur radio is the advent of software defined radios. I I believe that like everything else the mechanical radios are, you know, and when I say mechanical I mean having knobs and buttons and switches on them. They're really going to be a thing of the past before we know it. Sure, I mean I like boat anchors like everyone else and and you know, I wouldn't mind playing with a boat anchor and having one on my desk, but uh, uh, for being a, a, a technology lover as I am, it's it's the software defined radios that really get you know that really interest me quite a bit, and uh, you know anything that's uh, that has automation working with it, 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 it's sort of a mixed bag for me. For example. There are a lot of people that are that are using IRLP and uh, you know digital radio and and linking through the internet, things like that. Uh, I'm not as interested in. They, I don't I don't have anything against them. I'm just not interested in them. Uh, 
I, I really think that there's a certain magic to ham radio where I know that I can literally throw a piece of wire up into a tree and in, and in five minutes be talking to somewhere, someone on the other side of the world. There's really no other hobby that can accomplish that. And, and I'm not talking about using the Internet. You know, I'm talking about a direct connection using the, the tools and the equipment that you have at hand. That's a skill that I think that, that uh, isn't replicated in any other hobby. And it's one of the things that, for me, still makes, defines ham radio. What advice then would you give to newer returning hams? The first advice I would give them is to is to go online. I mean, I would say go online to QRZ, but that would be a shameless plug. Well, you could do that though. Okay, go online to QRZ and spend time there and see what other people are doing because there's a whole lot going on out there. And uh, a lot of times, if you're in a small town or uh, you may not know another ham if you're just getting started, and it might seem like they're all very distant to you. But once you go online, you'll find out that there's a whole lot of hams out there, and they're closer than you think. And in fact, online, they're right there at your fingertips. Roughly one in a thousand people are into ham radio, and you have to stop and think about that. Throughout the entire United States, there's roughly 700 or so thousand licensed hams, you know, Look at that against the population, and uh, it's it's. Uh, I know the math doesn't work there, but but roughly a one in a thousand though is still a good number to consider that you're not going to meet another ham just by accident. So you you need to go out, you need to find out what's going on, and the internet's the place to do that. Uh, Facebook is also a place to do it, although it's not not as good as uh, as QRZ, only because it's the uh, QRZ is dedicated to ham radio. But uh, avail yourselves of the tools, and ham radio literally will come to you. That's my advice. Well, I think an, another thing that you pointed out here earlier, and that is, is is that you have the QRZ grid map. So if you look up your grid square, then you could find out what hams live around you. Isn't that right? That's right, and it's great fun, too, when you're driving around a neighborhood and, and uh, you see an antenna there and on your mobile phone, bing, 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 oh, you got his name, his call sign, and even a picture of the guy, just like that. It's a lot of fun. Well, I've no, been known to, um, when I'm driving through a neighborhood here in Israel and I see a ham radio antenna, to um, pull over, stop, and ring the doorbell and see who's there. Yeah, that that, uh, that works in some parts of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you could get shot maybe in other parts of the world, but, um, but I found that to be uh, kind of an interesting way to meet hams. Well, Fred, you've been a terrific guest, and I really appreciate your making time to speak with me on the QSO Today podcast. It was a lot of fun. I'm going to spend more time on QRZ now. So with that, I want to wish you 73 and thanks. Thank you, Eric. It's certainly been a pleasure for me too. And uh, best wishes to you and your podcast and uh, your family and uh, everything else. Thank you. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Fred. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in AA7BQ in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of these fine sponsors by clicking on their links in the show notes pages or when you make your purchases that you say that you heard it here on QSO Today. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference. QSO Today is now available on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Libsyn, and TuneIn, as well as the iTunes Store. If you own an Amazon Echo, you can say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. I still use Stitcher to listen to podcasts on my smartphone. The links to all of these services are on the show notes pages on the right side. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.